Hello, everyone. My name is Charles Smoot. I'm the author of Fallen from Grace, and I'll be your host today. We want to thank you for tuning in to this special webinar, and we're excited to have you as a guest on our Grace Study Hour webinar today. We're going to get started right away and just get into uh, what the Lord has laid upon our heart to share with you today. So relax, sit back, grab your Bible, grab your favorite beverage, and we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time, not too much time, but a little bit of time, and talk about some very, very important principles today. Thank you for joining us. If you have your Bible and you want to join me in 1 Peter 4.10, the Apostle Peter said this about grace. As every man has received the gift, charisma, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In this scripture, the Apostle Peter, writing in his first epistle, gives us some insight into this thing that the Bible calls grace. And one of the things that he says about God's grace is this. He says that it is manifold and that we are stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now the word manifold uh, in the Greek simply means various colors, variegated or of various sorts. So that gives us some insight into our subject tonight and that is, so what is this thing called grace? Now, before we move on, I want you to visualize in your mind your very best description or definition of grace. What is this thing called grace? I'm reminded of a story entitled The Blind Men and the Elephant. And this story really begins to put together a scenario where different people are trying to describe something that they are personally experiencing or have experienced. And so these six men were asked to describe what an elephant was. Each touched a part of the elephant. One would grab a hold of the tail. Another grabbed a hold of the elephant's trunk and held on. Another grabbed a huge leg and held on. Another grabbed a floppy ear and held on. And they each attempted to define the elephant according to their experience. Now, of course, they were all wide of the mark in defining the entire elephant, but they were all correct when defining the elephant from the perspective of their individual experience. And so when we begin to define grace, we approach the subject with a particular perspective of our own experience with it or what we've heard other people say about it. I'm sure the guy that held the trunk told the guy that held the tail, no, 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 no. Um, it's, it's not thin and, and, and hairy, but, but, but it's, uh, it, it's huge and, 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 and there's no hair on it and so on and so forth. And so here we are today 
asking the question, so what is this thing called grace? Now, we've all heard the patented definition of grace, and we learned this probably in Sunday school, or mom or dad or someone taught it to us, and that patented definition is unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. And to be quite honest with you, even though we may have um, poly parroted what someone told us grace was, did we and do we really have enough information about grace to really define it as the Bible systematically reveals it in the scripture? I want to begin by saying that God's grace is very, very variegated. It, it is of different sorts. It is of different kinds. And so when we look at God's grace, whenever God is doing something for us, to us, in us, or through us, it is through the means of and to the glory of his grace. Whenever grace is supplied to the believer, it is always given to help in the time of need. And so grace is supplied to the believer. Grace is given to the believer. Grace is manifested to the believer. Now, I want to take you back a little bit into the scripture to a scene where Jesus is beginning to teach his disciples how to pray. And he said, when you pray, pray after this manner. And he begins by saying, our Father who art in heaven. And then as he goes on down, he says this, give us this day our daily bread. Now notice, Jesus confines the supplying of bread to the day at hand. Give us this day our daily bread. And so what Jesus is trying to teach them is that God is the source and the supplier of all of our needs as believers. Go with me, if you will, to uh, journey into the Old Testament to a time when God began to deal with the nation of Israel as he mightily brought them out of the iron furnace, out of the house of bondage, out of Pharaoh's dominion, and he took them on a journey into a dry, barren, and desolate place called the wilderness. Now why would God, a God of grace, a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of compassion, why would he take his people out of one dire situation and then place them immediately in another situation with different circumstances? I want you to know that God is able to keep you, he's able to sustain you from one situation to the next situation. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter where you've been. There is always going to be a test in your life where you will have to depend solely and only upon God and His grace and His ability to sustain you. That's why Paul was told by the Lord, My grace is sufficient for thee, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, so here the children of Israel are, two and a half to three million strong, out 
in a place where they have never been before and all they have is the clothes on their back and what they brought with them out of Egypt. And it's not long before the little bit of foodstuffs that they have brought with them are exhausted and now their immediate need is for food. What does God do? He begins to teach the children of Israel how to walk by faith and not by sight and how to trust him for their every need. What does he do? God miraculously supplies food for them. He sends down from heaven every morning their daily bread called manna. Manna. Which means, what is it? What is it? And so this daily bread that came down from heaven that lay upon the frost of the ground every morning fresh with the morning dew, they called it manna. What is it? And that's the question that I pose to you tonight and to me is what is this thing called grace? And just as God supplied the manna to the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, God will supply all of your needs according to His riches in glory. The writer writing in the scripture says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that He was rich, yet He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. And so the Bible talks about the riches of His grace. The Bible talks about the glory of His grace. And so as we talk about this subject, what is this thing called grace? Just remember that just as God supplied and fed those Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness, God will give us our daily allotment of His grace. Now the manna was such that the children of Israel were told very specifically that they could gather as much as they needed and he that gathered much had nothing over, he that gathered little had no lack. So God met the specific demand or the specific requirement for each and every one of his children as they were out in this desert place. However, they could only collect enough manna for one day. And on Saturday before the Sabbath, they collected enough for two days. Now, it, there was no hoarding of the manna because the manna if it lasted to the next day, it was not edible because it would breed worms and stink. So what is God saying to us today in this illustration of, of the children of Israel in Egypt? God is saying to us, when we are on our knees and when we say to him, give us this day our daily bread, we are saying that, Lord, I acknowledge that I need a fresh supply of your grace every single day. And every single day, I rely totally and completely upon you. So whenever grace is supplied to the believer, it is always given to help in the time of need. Thus, grace always brings with it a divine benefit. Now, I want you to picture the most beautiful diamond that you could ever even imagine, or perhaps you may have seen a beautiful diamond. 
as a rare and treasured diamond, there is more than one facet or aspect of grace as it is systematically revealed in the scripture. And now we begin to see a little bit more about what Peter was talking about when he began to use that word manifest, or I'm sorry, that word manifold, which means of various sorts, of various colors, variegated. In a soteriological sense, that is, as it relates to our salvation and the process and processes of our salvation, we want to understand that grace is not just a word. Grace is not just an abstract term that we use in our Christianese every day. But grace is a very, very strong spiritual principle and foundational doctrine of righteousness by faith. You see, it is unmerited favor, yes, that is, un that is extended to undeserving people who evidence faith in the finished work of the cross. Now, why do we look at grace as a spiritual principle? Well, it's very simple. When we study the Bible, and particularly when we read the, the, the writings of Paul in the book of Romans, Paul begins to introduce us to a few spiritual principles or laws that are operative in the life of the believer. It's not too long before we come upon a scripture that says, but where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Now what is Paul saying to us? Paul is really talking about two laws or principles that are at work in the believer's life. One of them is the law of sin and death which dwells in our flesh, our fallen, unredemptive, or unregenerate nature. And he's also talking about another principle which is called the law or the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to take you... Uh, on a, on a journey here to your local airport, and as you're gazing out the window, you see a 747, tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of pounds, and it is parked on the runway. But you know, we never stop to think, how does an object that huge, filled with people and filled with fuel, and filled with their belongings, how does it manage to get down the runway, let alone become airborne and fly to a destination thousands of miles away? Well, we're going to look at this a little bit, because I believe it will help us to understand the principle of grace in our lives. First of all, we want to say that God's grace abound it is an abounding grace in fact it is in it is so powerful it is such a powerful principle in your life that god's grace is able to sustain and keep you through no matter what comes your way i want you to consider that sin is a very very strong principle that dwells in our members. Now, let's say I was the strongest man in the world. Let's say I picked up a rock and with all of my might and all of my strength, I hurled that rock 
into the air as high and as far as I could with all of my strength. Well, what will happen to that rock? Do I possess the strength, the mere physical strength and the ability to hurl that rock completely out of the atmosphere and into outer space and where it would keep going on for into infinity? Absolutely not. Why? Because my human strength, my human will, my human ability, the human attributes that are assigned to me are not greater than the power of this thing called gravity. And so it is with sin in our lives. As we struggle with sin, as sin has dominion over us, as Paul said, let not sin therefore have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now why does he say that? He says it because sin, though a very, very strong principle, and though we are weak in the flesh, are are not strong enough in our own nature and in our own effort to overcome sin, Paul tells us we are not to be dominated or to allow sin to rule and reign or have dominion over us because we are no longer under law but under grace. Now back to this airplane that's going down the runway. Soon the tower gives it the permission to take off and slowly but surely that thing begins to move slowly down the runway and then all of a sudden it begins to gather speed and before you know it, it is flying down the runway but it's not in the air yet and why isn't it in the air? Because there are opposing forces that are determined to keep that airplane bound to the earth. And my friend, sin is determined to keep you bound. It is determined to bring you down. It is determined to overcome your life. But thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that through His grace we receive His power. And so as that plane begins to, begins to fight against the principle of drag and the principle of inertia, other principles that are more positive come into play and the principle of thrust and the principle of lift begin to manifest themselves and finally the pressure under the wings is greater than that which is trying to hold it down and lo and behold that plane begins to rise and before long it soars into the heavens soars up there to the pack even to the point that we can no longer see it it has escaped the limitations of gravity and now it's on its way my friend the Bible tells us that that we who are in Christ Jesus operate by a different and a more powerful principle and that's why the Apostle Paul could write for the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Therefore, sin cannot hold you back. It can't hold you down. It can't keep you down. You might fall down. You might falter. But you will not be overcome of sin because the grace of God will abound and God will bring you into a place where you will eventually yield and give way to the principle of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Moving on, 
While the Old Testament carries the generic meaning of favor, in the New Testament, grace carries an expanded meaning depending on the particular circumstances, setting, and context in which the word grace or charis is found. In the New Testament, the Greek word charis bears out the benevolent aspect of grace as a gift. That's an, the first thing we need to understand about God's grace is that it is a gift. The very word means gift. So when people tell you, yes, we are saved by grace and not by works, but you have to do thus and so, you need to remind them that the grace of God is a gift. It is a gift or a divine benefit that he bestows upon the believer without merit. You can't work for grace any more than you can work for your own salvation. Your salvation is completely through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and it is completely a secure and established because of his finished work of the cross. You cannot add to it and you can't take away from it. Therefore, grace and its divine benefit is undeserved and without merit, which simply means performance or works on the part of the receiver. Therefore, if grace of any sort were based on merit, then as the Apostle Paul says, it would no longer qualify as grace because the gift or the divine benefit would be reckoned of debt or of obligation. Although one cannot earn nor does one deserve grace, yet it is sufficient and more than enough for any contingency in your life or mine. And so when we consider the context and the setting in which we find this rare and precious thing called grace. We are then able to appreciate the intended divine benefit that comes to us freely through the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. I want to look at four facets or four dimensions of this variegated many colored thing we call grace that Peter says is manifold grace. We're going to choose four today, but this is by no means an exhaustive list. Saving grace is God doing something for us. He justifies us he gives us right legal and moral standing in the sight of God. And we are declared not guilty. We are acquitted. Sanctifying grace after he saves us. Is God doing something in us? And believer, if you have been justified by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, if you have been declared righteous in standing with Christ, then rest assured that God's sanctifying grace is doing something in you, conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ into his likeness. And if you are saved and sanctified by the grace of God, God's grace is also persevering in your life. And persevering grace is God doing something to us. He is preserving 
us. When I was a child, I remember going to my grandmother's, going down into the basement with all the cobwebs and the damp smells and the dark corners and the bugs and everything and finding a shelf with a bunch of jars lined up that were full of preserves. All kinds of vegetables and fruit and things like this. And I didn't understand how you could put food in a jar and put it in the basement and open it up five years later and you could still eat it. Well, friends, a lot of believers don't understand the persevering grace of God and how that God is not only able to keep to save you but he's able to keep you saved in other words he's able to preserve you in Christ Jesus God is able to keep you from perishing God is able to keep you from spoiling. God is able to keep you. It's not by your power. It's not by your merit. It's not by your works. It's not by your effort. It's not by your righteousness nor by your holiness. But it is because God has placed you in Christ and he sealed you under the day of redemption and you are now sealed just like those preserves are hermetically sealed inside of that jaw and protected from contamination and they are preserved. Thus, it is with your salvation, my friend. Finally, we have enabling grace in which God is doing something through us and that is He is equipping us for service. He is equipping us for service. Lest we begin to think that it's our might, our intellect, how smart we are, how many degrees we have, what schools we've gone to, who we know, how much money we have. Let me remind you, my friend, if God is doing something through you, it is through His grace and through His grace alone, and there is nothing in you that can claim the merit of what God has freely given, bestowed upon you. Praise the Lord. Nevertheless, a further distinction needs to be made between common grace and covenant grace. You might say, well, Brother Smooth, what do you mean there's a difference between common grace and covenant grace? Well, Let's find out. It seems that all men, saved or not, are recipients of what I call common grace. It's also called in theology prevenient grace or the grace that goes before. And every man who receives the common grace of God will enjoy certain common benefits or blessings of God's goodness and mercy. Common grace is received before conversion and is imparted for the purposes of leading men to repentance through the goodness of God because the goodness of God leads us to repentance, the scripture says. After conversion, however, common grace gives way to what I call covenant grace, also known as subsequent grace or the grace that follows after. You see, you are in a covenant. God has a redemptive relationship covenant with you. If you are in Christ Jesus, then you have been enjoined to the new covenant. And because of the finished work of Christ, you 
are no longer a sinner on your way to hell, but you are now a believer who is now in a state of preservation, in a state of grace. A state of grace is simply a state of redemptive favor and blessing, not based upon what you do, but based on the finished work of Calvary. And believers alone have this special measure or fullness of grace because John said and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace he has given us that abounding grace that grace that abounds that is more than enough to meet any contingency any need in your life or mine that common grace leads to covenant grace can be seen in the following scriptures and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Just because common grace comes first doesn't mean that it is preferred over covenant grace. You see, John said, he must increase and I must decrease. And this is exactly what happens in a man or woman's life as they come to Christ. Common grace says, I've done my job, now I have to step away so that covenant grace can come in because covenant grace is based upon a better sacrifice, a better promise, a better covenant. And so it is a better, more powerful working of God's grace in your life. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now I want you to consider for a moment the verse of Scripture that says, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. You know, for many years I would read the Scripture, and I would keep coming back to it, and I was just troubled in my spirit because I just didn't get it. And I kept thinking, well, does it mean this? Well, does it mean that? Well, it must surely mean this, or it must surely mean that. Well, one day, out of the blue, God opened my understanding and dropped this into my spirit, and this is what he did. And this can be confirmed simply by looking at the construction of this verse in the Greek and understanding the Greek word for. The word for in this verse is anti. But the word anti doesn't mean against. The Antichrist is not one who is against Christ, even though he is against Christ, but he is Antichrist because he comes in the stead of, or in the place of, or in the room of the true Messiah. And so the word for in this verse means instead of, in place of, or in the room of. Therefore, the intended meaning is Christ gives the believer covenant grace in place of, or instead of, or in the room of, common grace. He gives us covenant grace for common grace. So what is this thing called grace as we bring our webinar to a close. Grace is the gift of God's unmerited favor that brings with it a divine benefit of a sort to undeserving people during a time of need. This is why the blind men were each right, but yet they did not fully comprehend the, the, the entire perspective of the dimensions 
and the comprehension of God's grace, which is as wide as it is long, as it is high, it is incomprehensible. It is abounding grace. So to one, grace is divine virtue. To another, divine assistance. To another, divine enablement, etc. Always on time. Always enough. And always free. Like the poem of the blind men, one's definition of grace will most likely reflect the perspective of which part of the elephant one experiences. I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope that we have been able to share something with you that will encourage you in your walk with Christ. And remember that God's grace, God's grace is always sufficient for any contingency in your life and mine. If this webinar was a blessing to you, please invite others by sending them this link, www.gracestudyhour.org. That's www.gracestudyhour.org. And that's every Sunday evening, Eastern Standard Time at 6 p.m. God bless you. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good night.